All right, Big Bang, today is Thursday. It is March 14th. Welcome to the Dog Walk presented by Barstool Sports. I'm joined in studio by Jerry Finnegan. Uh, Jerry uh, was a former uh, Chicago police officer who did 10 years in federal prison. Uh, you have been uh, doing the Finnegan's Take podcast, uh, and it's one of those things that it's been kind of making its way through like I, I grew up on the northwest side and I'm, I'm a lot of cops I know have listened to it obviously and uh you know a lot of city workers and everything so I kind of wanted to have you in just kind of talk about everything so yeah, thank I you for being it. here yeah I appreciate you for having me yeah so it's uh it's been a it's been a wild life huh yeah it has it has yeah. um uh like you said the uh, the podcast has given me uh the ability to tell my side of the story uh and uh kind of give people a uh, peek inside the you know, the department, how it works, the politics, uh, some of the politics that are involved around the city. Um, but for the most part, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, been quite a life. Um, had a great job, uh, but fucked it up. Yeah. For lack of a better term. Mm-hmm. And, and the, the show's great. It's like a mini series. What's that like? 15 episodes or something? Yeah, it's, it's uh, 15 uh, uh, conversations with uh, Neil Edelstein, uh, who did a great job. Yeah. Uh, Neil has a back, uh, background with Hollywood uh, as a producer and, um, so his professionalism and uh, his experience really helped out on it, uh, came out well. Yeah, you and Neil definitely did a good job on it. And it's because one of those things where it seems like it's, you know, I'm sure you watched, did you see the 7-5? Uh, I did. Yeah, 7-5, and then there was uh, obviously uh, the the one with Wayne Jenkins. I'm blanking on the name right now. Yeah, excellent show. I think it was, wasn't it We Own This City? Yes, We Own This City, the Baltimore yeah. uh, Trace Tax excellent Force. Excellent series. Yeah. He's a great actor. I love him. Yeah, he's great. John Berthold's yeah. great. Yeah. So kind of, if I'm correct, kind of in the same vein, that's yeah. what you were doing. Yeah, basically. Um, yes. We went out there every day. Um, we didn't look to steal money. That wasn't our incentive uh, to go out there and do things. We went out there to uh, lock gangbangers up with guns and collect uh, guns off the streets. We recovered a ton of guns citywide. As a matter of fact, uh, our unit led the city in gun recoveries. Um, and what they would do is they would send us to specific areas to address high crime rates, uh, whether they were shootings, uh, drug sales, um, they had some murders. Uh, we would saturate that area and uh, we were effective. Um, we didn't we didn't take any prisoners. I mean, uh, as far as like take any prisoners, we took them in, but I mean, like a cliche, we didn't take any prisoners. Everybody went to jail. Mm-hmm. So you you took, and everything I said in the, in the podcast, you, you took being a cop very seriously. Yeah, it, I mean, there's that, the fun aspect yeah, of it yeah, too, yeah. Eddie. Uh-huh. I mean, we, we made light of a lot of things because otherwise you'll go crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we gave a lot of people breaks. Uh, there were people, I mean, you can hammer people every day for shit out there, but I mean, you want to take somebody to jail for weed. I mean, weed now it's so prevalent. Yeah. You know, you can't drive down the street without getting a contact buzz behind somebody. Yeah. Literally. It's a lot different. Yeah. Yeah. That's but, sure. but I mean, uh, I could say that I probably never put anybody in prison for dope and made some huge recoveries. Uh, that's because we didn't have warrants to arrest them. So we did illegal searches, recovered the narcotics, and the cases were pretty much thrown out. But it hurt the cartels because we recovered a lot of dope uh, and a lot of guns. And we could we could do the abbreviated version, I guess, yeah. because I'm sure a lot of people are crossing over listening. And if you haven't listened yet, definitely go listen. But so so you start off, you're, you're just standard beat cop, right? Yeah, we were in, uh, some days we were in plain clothes and, and on our car. But like I said in the podcast, uh, you know, even three year old kids in the ghetto knew who you were. Mm-hmm. You're not fooling anybody. Yeah. Um, only yeah. the white suburbanites that know you were the police. And you were mostly just making uh, just stops on, you know, stopping everything that moved. I mean, literally, we'd stop 50 cars a day, uh, sometimes more. Um, rain or shine, it didn't make a difference. We were stopping people uh, at that time, pulling them out of their cars, searching their vehicles, uh, getting guns. Then we'd flip them, you know, like it would actually uh, equate to be like the police show. Like you would watch cops, same thing. You know, you you keep working up the chain, the food chain. And we'd get a guy with a gun, give us some more guns, give us a house with more guns or dope. And then we'd, we'd go. Sometimes we'd work 15, 17 hours straight. Um, and is that what you were instructed to do? Like, hey, let's go. Yeah, yeah. The city, you know, the police department, our bosses, they wanted the guns. Mm-hmm. And at that time, it was Daly was the mayor. And he wanted the guns because it, it went up the chain and it reflected on the bosses on the police department. It reflected on the mayor where he could go in his news conference and say, my police officers record, uh, covered X amount of guns from an incident on the south side today. So there were some, you know, pretty big busts. And 
uh, they were all like newsworthy. Mm -hmm. So it helped. So about what year is this when you start? Yeah, I started on a job in 1988, but okay. I didn't go to uh, special operations until the spring of uh, 1994. Okay, so 88 to like 94, you're you're doing the plain clothes unit. You said basically? yeah, I was. I worked uh, the the beat car in uh, the seventh district, uniform every day with a partner, um, and then from there, uh, I went to a unit called uh, Gang Crimes West, which was out of Harrison and Kedzie, and it only worked at 10th, 11th, 12th, and 13th districts, which was Area Four. And uh, we would just address the gang problems in there or like crimes in progress. Okay. And then so in 94, when you get into the SOS, a special operations section, that is a operation that you're trying to get guns. Like that's what, is that the sole thing you're looking for at that point? Yeah. Guns and, and uh, well, you know, dope. I mean, I really wasn't a big dope guy, but I did get some big seizures, but like the, the nickel and dime dope on the corner, I would not chase a guy down for 10 bags of uh, crack or 10 bags of heroin or even 60 bags of heroin. Cause I mean, to be honest with you, Eddie, I, you're not going to win the war on drugs like, that way anyway. Now was that, so was that, that was your call, but technically you the yeah. SOS, you were supposed to be doing all illegal activity, right? Yes. No? All okay. illegal activity. But I liked uh, and you're going to come across dope no matter what, because yeah. it's all entwined. Yeah. So the dope led to the guns and vice versa. Um, so you would get, you would get somebody and you would just, you squeeze them literally mm -hmm. either, you know, give me a gun, you're going to jail. Well, you, you know, you're going to take me to jail or you're going to put this on me. If I give you something else, I could take you to jail right now. I don't have to do that. You know, I, I got a gun on you right now. I'll take you to jail. Most of them were felons. They were in prison already and they didn't want to go back. Mm -hmm. So for the most part. They gave up everybody, including their own grandmothers. So that was a Jerry Finnegan philosophy. Like, yeah. I'm not going to beat drugs. I yep. can make a difference with guns. Yep. So everybody I see with drugs, I'm going to say, hey, I could get you on drugs, but I'd rather get you someone on guns. Tell me where the guns are. Exactly. But okay. there were always guns on the drug spots. Too. Yeah, it was all. Always. It was they had fun, security. Like yeah. And they always had a couple guys working, carrying guns. So uh, those were the guys that were mostly the runners. So from 88 to 94, when you're a beat cop. Were you were you pretty clean then? Were like, were yeah, you... I didn't I didn't uh, fuck around with stealing money or anything then. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I bent the rules. There's no doubt. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, I falsified police reports. If I, if I got a guy dirty, he's dirty. He knows he's dirty. He's out there doing dirty shit. So I fudged the, the police reports to make sure that I had po uh, probable cause. I, is it bad? Yeah, probably. But he's not doing the best thing either. He's breaking the law. He's doing shit. He's hurting and killing people out here. So I help them out a little bit. Rationalizing. Yeah, I'm not, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. How much? How much was? How much rationalizing was there in your mind? To me, I, I felt that um, if you get a guy who is selling dope and he's working with a couple of guys on the block, and people can't go out of their house, the kids can't play on the street without worrying about a stray uh, bullet hitting them. To me, I couldn't fucking stand them. You know, I mean, I understand they were making money and they were trying to support themselves, but it wasn't for the good. It was for their greed, just like me stealing money. It was for greed. It wasn't something I should have did in the first place. Yeah. Okay. And then now, was this something you're in the SOS now? So the the difference here is like, explain the main difference between I'm on the special task force here or I'm on the special operations, operations. Mm -hmm. versus the B car. Like what, like you're not having to worry about radio calls yeah going to. so you're not tied down to a radio per se because like you know they'll broadcast uh you know it's called the simulcast and they'll broadcast a crime in progress or like a man with a gun in the 11th district and they'll say any units in the 11th district or 1131 and units on the citywide which we were on the citywide band you know and they'd say a man with a gun at 16 or, or to actually uh 1000 south sacramento so you'd go and look for that guy they'd give you a description uh, so you had a lot of freedom, not having to be tied down to the radio. Uh, I was also on the predecessor to SWAT, which was called uh, Hostage Barricade Team. Great program. Had a lot of great jobs on that. Um, so uh, it was exciting. I mean, the whole time in, that I was on that job, never had a boring day. Mm -hmm. Even a shit day where it was snowing, blizzard, was it was a good day. Mm -hmm. You did that for a while, and then you, you I, was, there was a little spot between there where you... Yeah, so I was I was in SOS uh, ten years, and uh, I kind of got tired of the, the same stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, it was the same locking up people every day. The, you know, the hunt uh, for people with guns, people with dope. Uh, so I took a break and went to Midway Airport. Um, 
And, you know, they say the grass is always greener. Well, it was because it wasn't, there was nothing going on there. My first month there, I got a guy for an armed robbery, stabbed uh, a guy who was a store manager in one of the stores, stabbed him with a Phillips screwdriver about 27 times in his face, his neck, his back. Jesus. Yeah, he was trying to get out. This this was pre-9-11, right before 9-11. And um, he was able to get through somehow through the metal detector. I assume he knows somebody there at the checkpoint. So uh, I was alerted by two of the workers that uh, their boss was either having an asthma attack or he was sick. They probably didn't want to get involved but knew what was going on. So the girl gave me the key. I opened the door, and there's a guy in there stabbing the shit out of this guy. And you can smell that uh, iron smell from blood. And it's like everywhere. So it was a little, uh, this, this guy was a, a little Asian guy and he was fighting for his life. Uh, and the guy kicked the door on me. So I pushed the door back open, fought with him, got him in custody. Uh, and there was another kid that came to help me, Ed Kazupski, or actually Terry Kazupski. I worked with both of them, but uh, Terry Kazupski. And we, uh, we arrested him and uh, he pled out. He took a shitload of time. And that was like, supposed to be a slow spot you yeah but that was like the that, end yeah. of it eddie after uh-huh. that it was pissers and smokers yeah. people smoking in the bathrooms there and it's just like it was driving me nuts yeah, yeah, man yeah. you know lost yeah. bags and you yeah. know drunks and just yeah yeah, menial shit. yeah it was time to go so, back and you know go back and get in the action so. so so your first like 10 year 10 year stint were you were you stealing money then uh yeah i was stealing money in, in sos yep okay so like 94 was it like instantly you're like oh i I'm, well I'm excited to do this because no, it'll and, give and me more of an I would say I would say it probably occurred maybe later, like maybe 99, 2000, okay. so in that part of my career. So we were coming across uh, seizures of drugs, pretty sizable amounts, and then there was money and guns with it. We turned the, the drugs in, turned the guns in, but never turned the money in. Then we'd split it up. Um, the stupidest thing I ever did. It cost me my career and my freedom. And, and it's really... As far as like Chicago police scandals go, where is it? Well, they said it was one of the biggest scandals. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, there's been a lot of big scandals. If they say it's the biggest one, I don't, I'm not going to call them a lawyer, but yeah, I don't yeah, yeah. I don't think it was because, uh, you know, we, we didn't falsely put pr- people in prison. Uh, you know, we didn't beat people down and, you know, torture them. So, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but you, so, so in your eyes, like, you don't think it's. Oh, no, it just, it definitely yeah. was, definitely was yeah. a scandal. Uh, it reflected on us as individuals and on the department and other police officers. So in that, I, f- I have regret for because I put them in a bad light. Now, what was it that comes at like, what, so you're like year 11 or year 12 at that point? Mm-hmm. What was it then where you're like, was it just like you were comfortable? Like you, you, like you said, like ra- you rationalized, like I've been doing this for 12 years. I see where this shit's going to go. Like I'm just going to take it for myself. Yeah, a little bit of both, but the the main thing was uh, I was a little sour. Uh, I hadn't been able to be promoted. Um, saw a lot of people being promoted around me. Uh, did a lot of work, but just got complaints out of them instead of, you know, I got accolades. I was decorated. Uh, but on the other hand, never had the opportunity. Uh, I didn't study for the exams, so no one could fault nobody but myself for that. But on the other hand, I was put in for meritorious promotion and passed over because of the complaints. And I'm thinking, fuck it, I, I'm out here doing what they're asking me to do, but they don't want to turn their, their heads the other way when it comes to my complaints. So it was like, and, and you you refer back to a lot in the podcast, how you were real police. You were someone who actually got out there and did shit. Like you were. Yeah, I mean, we were, I mean there were guys that, uh, you know, not my last partner or my last two partners, but there were partners that they they fucking complained because they were like, you know, hey man, we got a gun already, dude. What do you what fuck? What are you, Superman? You know, you gotta worry about getting more stuff and I don't know. I mean, that's what we got paid to do. Yeah. I mean, I I don't know. I just didn't like just driving around wasting gas, to be honest with you. And then so in your mind you're like, I'm doing everything like I should be going above and beyond, really. Mm-hmm. I I I didn't study for these tests, but regardless, I should be at a higher rank. I'm not. Well, I got put. I got put in for meritorious a couple of times and was turned down. This it goes up to the superintendent. I had the first deputy sign off on it, right under him. But then the superintendent he nixed him. Um, I didn't know it at the time, Eddie, but I was. I had the most complaints in the city. Is that why he nixed you? Probably. Yeah. Yeah, probably. But uh, I mean, they weren't beating people down. I so mean, you very know. very few brutality complaints. Uh, mostly just illegal searches or uh, verbal abuse. Okay. Uh, 
So that's what it was primarily, but mm-hmm. there were there were some brutality complaints. And was that oh, something yeah, there that was really mm-hmm. like looked at then? Oh yeah. You yeah, know? they they look at it. And and the thing is they're supposed to after they're unfounded or not sustained, it's called, they're supposed to, to take them out of your file with the with the agreement of the uh the union. They never did. Okay. And do you remember your first one in ninety nine or two thousand? Do you remember the one the the day that you decide to go on the take, so to speak? Yeah. Can you, can you get into that one? Sure, sure. Um, we uh, we came into a house in the 11th district, uh, chased a guy in there with a gun, and uh, searching around, found some some dope that was bagged up. Uh, kept searching and found a paper bag with money. There were about uh, eight of us, and uh, took the money out of there and then split it up. And then I don't know, um, was nervous about it, but after it was over, I was thinking, "Fuck it, it's dope money. I'm not I'm not taking it from you know your grandmother." And and that's the reason I probably justified it like that. Yeah. But that wasn't a good justification because it was still stealing money and it was illegal. Yeah. But that isn't that like such a such a life changing moment, not as far as money goes, but as far as like once you cross that path, mm-hmm. there's really no going back. No, and, because it continued. Yeah. Uh, I never took like uh, for instance, we had people offer us money, like to uh, to protect their dope spots or leave them alone, mm-hmm. and we never did. Um, the stealing the money, like, you know, never took it off a person, but, you know, out of property, uh, not out of cars either, but out of homes. And we continued to do it. And I continued to do it. But was it like everyone's looking around? Like, were you the one to suggest like, hey, let's do it? No. I mean, th- th- there were days I found the money. There were other days other people found the money, you know, and it was just, yeah. I don't know. I just, it was us. It was pretty widespread. Yeah, because you know, like I, like I said, I yeah. watch all that shit. Yeah, and it's always like such a dramatic point. Like everyone's in a circle, and it's like, oh, yeah, no, we're wasn't, doing this. It, we're not. It's not like that. no, it's not like like like, like that TV show yeah, you exactly. alluded to about yes. him. He turns the table upside down. He finds it. And the guy's like great eye. Yeah, no, it wasn't it's like that. Not like that at all. No, because what you're, you're not going to say something in front of somebody who's in the house. Yeah, and say, hey, I just found that bag of money. Let's fucking get out of here. Yeah, yeah. So you know, it's, it's it was like down. As, it was kind of like. You know, nobody talked about it. And then when you got out of there, someone would say, hey, I found I found some cash. And here you go. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And then if, like, it, would you be, like, kind of suspect if someone doesn't take it or something? No. How but does that go? There like, were guys, the... there were guys, Eddie, there were a few guys, um, uh, you know, like uh, John Brzezinski, for instance. He, he took money and he would hide it on his body and never tell us he found anything. So, I mean, there's no honor among thieves, obviously. But on the other hand, this guy, you're going to get a beef for him. You know, beef, a complaint. You're going to get a beef and this fucking guy's stealing money, but he doesn't tell you you took it out of there. So it's almost like, you know, you couldn't trust anybody. So, yeah. So how does that go then? That first raid, like you said, he split it between eight people. I assume who's ever, whoever the dealer was, they're like, hey, there was also money in there. It's gone. Very but seldom. Seldom. They never asked for their money. Never. Why? It was part of the game, I guess. They yeah. realized it. Uh, you know, I mean, um, I can't, I can't put it like put my finger on it, but I would assume other people had taken money from them on the police department, had taken money yeah, from but, these guys before, so they knew that was part of the game. Yeah, but in their heads, it should have been like a quick way to kind of jam you guys up in a sense, right? But yeah, but I mean, on the other hand, do you, uh, do you, as a dope dealer, do you want the police coming down on you afterwards because you're going to beef on some coppers and you're going to see them every day because they're from your area? Yeah. So mm-hmm. I would think that would that would be a deterrent. So yeah, true. Now, now is that day like is that like a light day or did you like have that in your mind like, well, I just did something that's pretty mm-hmm. impactful if things go south. Yeah. Or well, you're like, no, oh, this is it. No, no, because you're thinking, when you, when I took that money that day, I'm thinking, you know, fuck, man, if they call for a sergeant or, you know, a supervisor to come over there and then all of a sudden they say, this guy's in the house, this guy's in the house, where's the money? There was no money. You can say it, so it's going to be he said, you said. Yeah. No, no, that, I get that. If they got a camera, you're fucked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You it's know? Not really. Back then it was you know even even the phones there there was no ability to to, to video the police a few and far between yeah. mm-hmm. i mean believe me i saw on on the street where people would come out with those fucking camcorders you know on a scene and they're like you know you all beating up on yeah you're with, beating up on you know so with like the vcrs yeah. and attached and like shit like yeah that, the yeah the fucking ones. things were yeah, huge yeah, yeah, you know yeah. they had like a arm thing on them and yes. you know yes um 
but I, I, I guess I'm asking more, uh, like internally, like more morally, like, did it, did it, did it bug you at all when you first it went did, down that road? It did because I knew that I had committed a crime, uh, and I, what I did was illegal. Um, and I hate to say it, Eddie, but I justified it by, like I said, fuck it, it's dope money. Um, terrible way to do it, but that's how I probably, uh, delayed the thoughts of me being, you know, bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause like, I, I've, I've heard like, and I asked some people around when I mm -hmm. when I was new to, when I knew I was gonna have you in. I was like, you know, hey, anything you'd ask him, anything you know, like whatever. Just trying to do my research. They're like, besides what he did at the end, I heard he was a pretty good cop. You know, mm -hmm. like I heard he was, you know, like you said, like mm -hmm. you, how, you accounted for how many guns? Like, uh, well, the one year was the most I got was like one, uh, I think, a hundred and twenty three guns in a year, which so, was like that, like led the yeah, that, that led the unit for yeah. sure, but mm -hmm. um. You know, when when I was in the 7th District on the tag team there, uh, the whole tag team, these guys were workers. So, um, like I said in the podcast, for every gun you took off the street, there was a fucking gun to replace it. Mm -hmm. Because these people were bringing, like, straw purchases and going and buying 10, 20 guns at a time at a show in Tennessee before they really stamped it down, the, you know, the uh, ATF. Did you go to, like, conventions like that? Have you ever done, like, any recon from the other side? No. Have you ever well, seen, like, what actually happened? Because everyone talks about how much the Indiana is... is they used to have at the Rosemont, but then they stopped it. They just wouldn't allow it anymore? Or yeah, I, think, kinda... I think the governor kind of... Not this guy. But I think it might have been Rauner or maybe the, the governor before that. It might have been Blagojevich. Yeah. But they stopped those gun shows up there. But in Indiana, Tennessee, Florida, I mean, Eddie, these, these fucking things are packed, man. Mm -hmm. I've seen them. I've seen them on videos. And I, I mean, there's anything and everything's there. And have you ever, because in a sense, it's like you're you're a high-level exterminator, you know? You're getting rid of these guns. And then do you yeah. ever see when the next pack comes in, though? Like like how, like how from the other side, it's like, oh, this is like, because it had to be truly mind-blowing to see the, just the excess that they're able to keep coming up with. It is. And some of the stuff they have, you're just blown away. You're like, what the, this is before uh, Jamie, uh, or uh, Weiss was his name, I think Jody Weiss put the long guns back in the car because they never, we had shotguns. They took them out after a, something happened like 1970 or 74 or something. Um, but the long guns were put in a car, but they also make it hard on uh, the individual police officers to qualify with these guns. I mean, they're like really sticklers. Um, but now you see stuff on, on videos where these guys are stick up crews and they all, they're all getting out of cars with, with, you know, two twenty threes like, you know, or SKS, and how do you fight that? You're a one-man car. You pull up on a robbery in progress. You got four guys that are going to go to war with you with a rifle. Crazy. You know, I mean, you might want to take a couple of minutes to get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's that really is like the, the magnitude of some of these guns. So, the, is it like a bigger operation in your mind? It, to me, it seems. I mean, they're the guns were out there. They were out there because we got tons of them. Yeah. But they're more in use, and if that sounds crazy. It just seems like they're shooting at people more. They're shooting at the police more. Um, it's just, you know, multiple shootings constantly. I mean, we had drive-bys where there would be multiple people shot. But this is a regular thing now in Chicago. You know, I mean, it's before it would be breaking news, you know, uh, eight people shot uh, on the south side. Now it's it's not even a lead story anymore. It, you know, four stories down, you know. And then there's a, there, oh, there was a big shooting on the south side today. Or on the west side. So it's not that there's more guns in circulation. It's just they're just being there. We see them more because there's more shootings and stuff. Yeah, more shootings. And uh, there's no, the cars are not being stopped like they used to be. I, I understand the point of the police officers not wanting to lose their livelihoods or lose their freedom for that matter. Um, but it used to be where you would stop a shitload of cars every day and you'd come up with guns. They take off, bail out of the car, take off high speed chase. Now, and I'm not exaggerating. I'm like, I'm not all out there every day looking, but I don't see fucking police stopping people anymore in the city. Weirdly, I've noticed a little bit more lately. Well, it's but good. More like, but yeah, more like uh, like traffic shit, obviously. Yeah, but traffic yeah, 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 I mean, yeah, traffic yeah. can lead to good shit. But I mean, on sure, the other yeah. hand, you know, that's a good that's a good uh, probable cause. But right, yeah. what I'm saying is they're not getting these these dirty gangbangers and stopping them, you know, because there's something on the car wrong and getting them out. I just don't see it anymore.
Hey, let's take a quick break here because we're going to talk about Stella Blue Coffee. At Stella Blue Coffee, we believe good coffee is one of life's non-negotiables. Uh, stop drinking those boring, tasteless, big coffee beans and turn to Stella Blue. Remember, your mornings are sacred. It's time to start treating them that way. And uh, not only are Stella Blue Coffee's premium beans sourced from the most coffee-rich geographies on earth, but they're also Big Cat Tasted and Approved, which uh, obviously is more important. Uh, Stella Blue Coffee's delicious roasts are available in cold brew, K-cups, ground, and whole bean formats to seamlessly fit into your morning coffee routine. Oh, and every bag helps save dogs. Every bag sold helps save dogs, I should say. Uh, so head to uh, your local Jewel Osco or Mariano's today to find the very best deals on Stella Blue Coffee or use promo code WALK for 20% off any order of $25 or more on StellaBlueCoffee.com. Take back your morning with Stella Blue Coffee. Go do it. All right, let's get back into it. Do you remember what it was, what you got on that first bust? Money-wise? Yeah. It was a couple thousand dollars, I believed. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. and, and, that, and that's a pittance of amount of money to lose your job or get arrested for, for sure i mean you know what i mean so right. it was stupidity mm -hmm. but how many of those are you doing a week uh not i mean we uh, honestly eddie we're not looking to go out and steal money so it wasn't like hey if you we came across paid. no it was no. just a, it was yeah. just a hey, little bonus across, yeah if we came across it uh -huh. yeah we didn't actively go to look to steal money so that was like 99 and then you're doing this like how many years are you taking money? Uh, I was taking money pretty much till up to the time that I was arrested. And what year and was that? Indicted, 2006. So 2006. Mm -hmm. So that, besides your little stint at Midway, mm -hmm. you're on the SOS. And yes. every bus that you come across, you're getting guns, but there is money. You're taking well, money. They're taking a call. Not every time that, that there's not money all the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. I'm just every but time when there, get is guns, money, when there is money. Yes, absolutely. Correct. So you're taking yep. a little bit there. That's right. What would you, do you have any kind of estimate of what you- Total wise? Yeah. Well, I told you the one incident, we got $450,000 uh, out of a house. Where was that at? That was in unincorporated Stickney. So Chicago on the south side um, from Archer Avenue, I don't know if you're familiar with that, mm -hmm. to the Stevenson Expressway, 55th Street. There's a stretch down Central, uh, Central Avenue. And uh, from there to Harlem, going a couple blocks, four blocks for five blocks east and, and probably about a mile west is unincorporated Stickney, it's called. So the Cook County Sheriff patrols that. So uh, we stop a guy uh, with a um, brand new Ford Explorer with California tags on it. And uh, we're working a three-man car. So I'm at an intersection with a stop sign. The guy goes by and he, he's looking straight ahead. He won't even look at us. So I said, I'm going to put a stop on this dude. So we get behind him, put a stop on him, put the lights on. He pulls over. I walk up to the car, and uh, I'm driving, so I walk up to the car. They come out to assist me. And uh, I said, do you have a driver's license, sir? And uh, he takes his license, and he hands it to me. And he has a uh, California driver's license. No, he had an Illinois driver's license. And he was shaking so much, he was literally fanning me with the license because he was holding it up. So he was quite nervous. So I said, why don't you step out for a second? Now, he gets out of the vehicle. I said, I'm going to, you know, pat you down. I don't, I don't want to, like, make it long-winded here. We get him in a car. Uh, he doesn't have anything on him. Get him in a car. He's giving us uh, evasive answers about where he lives. Um, so we look in the vehicle. We find some paperwork in there with an address in unincorporated Stickney. And uh, myself and another guy, Bart Maka, uh, we tell Brian Pratcher, who's with us, to watch the guy, he's cuffed up. We walk back a couple blocks to the house with his keys, I open the door, and his wife's in there, and uh, she doesn't speak English. So we go in the house, and uh, she doesn't speak English. Neither of us speak Spanish. So I tell Bart, look around a little bit. He tells me uh, there's a gun in the bedroom. That's okay, because it's not Chicago. It's, it's Stickney. So I said, anything else? So he's looking around, he comes back out, he says, I just found a big bag with a bunch of kilos. I said, okay, keep an eye on her. Let me take a look. I go in there and I look and I said, um, I come back out. I said, Bart, that's not kilos. It's money. It's bricks of money in cellophane. And this is where under the bed? No, it was just in the closet in okay. the kid's room. Okay. So um, he says, what are we doing? I said, let's go. We'll take the money. So we walk out. We don't say anything to her. We just walk out the back door. We tell Pratcher to come and pick us up. And we tell him, get rid of the guy, pick us up. We go to Marcus' house, leave the bag there. We go in and 
leave a couple hours early from our shift. We go back there and divide the money. It came out to one hundred fifty thousand a piece. Holy shit! Yeah, a lot of money. And and yeah. at that time, did you know was that like what would you, what would you have guessed? Like did four fifty like oh, shatter no. what you thought? No, I yeah absolutely. I yeah. I, I thought it, honestly I thought it was going to be a lot of fives and singles and yeah. shit, but it was like a lot of large denominations. Yeah. There were small denominations. Yeah, you know, but you could smell it. I mean, all money has that dope. You know, because it has that smell because it's intermingled. Mm -hmm. So when it's together, it really you can really smell it. Mm -hmm. Um, which doesn't mean shit, but I mean, this guy's not. He's got four hundred fifty thousand dollars in a duffel bag at his house. Mm -hmm. You know, he's he's not fucking working at Jewel. And did he seem to know what you guys had did when you came back or no? No, because Brian left them off about four blocks away. And then we left, took the bag to Bart Maka's, came back uh, after work and split it up. Uh, and that day, I wish I would have never seen that fucking money in my life. Damn, I was going to say that. Something. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought about it because I told these guys, I said, this dude's fucking, he's this cartel level. He's got $450,000 in his house. Yeah, I don't. You yeah. feel yeah, a absolutely. little bad and culpable, like that guy. Pro like he could have no. got killed after that. No, no, I don't think so because, I mean, the thing is, I didn't think he was going to be worried about getting killed because he went to the authorities. But it took him a little while to go to the authorities. I think Brzezinski told about the the incident, and then they contacted him, the state's attorney's office. Uh, so he sued the city uh, for the money. Uh, I was given a uh, city lawyer uh, or a private lawyer, and uh, it panned out that the federal judge said, take the money that they're offering the city was $90,000 and be happy. You don't want to open up a can of worms. His contention was he sold the property in Mexico and brought the money back in. So we had a DEA special agent uh, who was an expert witness and said, absolutely zero chance of that. He said, nobody brings fucking money back in. They're taking money out, but they're not bringing it back in. They're bringing product back in, but not money. Yeah. Damn, dude. And, and you say you wish you never came across it because it was yeah. too much? Well, not or only because... too much. It's just, you know what? It was like, it started a whole fucking deal. Uh, you know, it got to the point where, you know, I I spent money on stupid stuff with that. What'd you buy? Um, I bought a new sound system. Mm -hmm. Um, bought some, you know, like some vacations, uh, Benihana, I mean, dumb shit. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, 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 and the end result was I lost my fucking career over that. Yeah. And was that one of the, the what year was that one? Oh, maybe 2002 or three. I think it was. Okay. So you still got a couple more years after that. Yeah. That was just the biggest one. In that your was career. the biggest one. That yeah. was the biggest one. Yeah. So was that like, is your lifestyle changing rapidly at that point like is your wife kind of like what like i hit i mean honestly i hid stuff from my wife yeah. because i didn't want her to be nervous i didn't want her to know what was going on yeah so i did work overtime i worked a movie detail so i kind of said you know i was covering the money you know going on vacation i mean you know i don't know if she's it's not stupid but on the other hand, she didn't really question me. And where do you keep this hundred fifty thousand dollars? I kept it in the basement uh, under a dresser. Yeah. I took the bundles out and put it under a dresser. Which, when Maka went to vacation to Mexico with his wife, he brought a bag over and asked me to watch it with his guns and some money in it. And then uh, I told him to go in and get his bag. I went up and grabbed the beer for us, and he stole thirty thousand dollars out of my fucking stash. No shit. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. that's yeah. So that goes to show you, there's no fucking honor among thieves. Fuck no, there's not. I mean, everyone's kind of looking out for themselves there. Yeah, I confronted him about it. I ended up getting 10000 back. He denied it, but, yeah. you know, I knew it was him. So now, is this thing, like, this little dresser, it's just piling up? No, no. Uh, well, that was only the spot for that big yeah, thing? Yeah, it was just have... for that big thing. I never okay. put it. It wasn't like, you know, we didn't get millions of dollars, Eddie. Um, so that was the biggest seizure we ever got. And we got a couple, like... We got some fifty some thousand dollars. We got a sixty some thousand dollars. I think one time, uh, and then Herrera said we got eighty some thousand dollars, but I never saw that. And and I, there were, and you could validify this or not, but there were a rumor that I heard that when you because you don't live there anymore, right? Uh huh. Yeah, like that house. There mm -hmm. were, like there were holes knocked out and everything. Like was that, is that true? Holes knocked like, out, like out of the drywall and uh, like. Like maybe someone came back and kind of grabbed some some hidden money. 
Oh, no. 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 I wish. <laughs> Fuck, I wish. <laughs> you know what? Yeah. I, I mean, you know, I mean, honestly, uh, yeah, I could have used it. Uh, I wish. Uh, you know, I heard that I had money buried in the yard. Uh, you know, listen, the FBI, they raided my house when they arrested me. There were probably 20 uh, task force officers, which are policemen, and FBI agents. They had a uh, drug sniffing dog and they had a helicopter. So, they I mean, yeah. Recovered a lot. Yeah. Or it could have just been people when they were selling it, they kind of broke in. You know, you're kind of like the haunted house. Like, yeah, hey, it could be. We'll I mean, see it could if be. this guy left any behind. Yeah, no, I wouldn't have put it in the fucking walls. I was <laughs> dumb to put it under a dresser. So. Um, so, what would you say, like, if you had to guess, like, what would you say? you ended up with uh total yeah a couple hundred thousand dollars after yeah. probably yeah because by the time you split it all up uh maybe maybe 250 um really because i mean you have to split it up eight ten ways and everybody got an equal amount because some guys were bitching why why the fuck should he get it uh and i go is it your money i go you don't fucking cut this guy out if you cut him out he's gonna beef to somebody because he got shortchanged yeah there's that's the last thing you want to do. Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah. I mean, even the fucking idiots that just rode along got money. Now, is this something where, uh, like, you're thinking about it all the time? Like, you, like, are you when, when you're laying in bed at night, is mm -hmm. this something you're like, fuck, like, this is going to catch up to me? Did you ever think it would catch up to you? I did. Yeah. I did. Uh, and it's funny you say that because it, it, the inevitability of it, it, you know, I mean, it can't, it can't go on forever. Uh, although you'd like to think it, it could. But um, you got 10 guys involved. Well, someone's going to say something or do something stupid. And they did. They ended up doing dumb shit towards the end where they got jammed up and snitched. They went to the grand jury against me, almost every one of them. Um, one guy got caught with a crack whore and fucking Cicero in uniform. You know, the fucking state attorney was following him. And I'm like, whatever, man, you know, if that's what floats your boat. And we uh, could kind of get into that too, because yeah. I guess for the people who are listening here that may not listen to the series, although mm -hmm. I do suggest you listen, that uh, the unraveling of it all, like how did it, how did it go down? Yeah. So uh, John Brzezinski was uh, the biggest one. He committed insurance fraud. He so report. He this is one of the cops that is in mm -hmm. with you. Yeah. He report. He was transferred to the FBI task force, um, a, jo a joint terrorism task force. It was called, but it was an FBI task force. And uh, so he got a take-home car, uh, and it was a covert vehicle. Like, uh, I think they gave him a Mitsubishi SUV, you know, and they outfit it with the lights and all that shit. But, um, excuse me. So he reported his 1996 um, Blazer, I think it was at the time, stolen. And uh, he asked me to recover it. So I, I mean, it's a Chevy. I saw him. A shitload of cars stolen. Policemen's cars, doctors' cars, everybody. So I recovered the vehicle by making a report out for him. Not the actual theft case report, but the recovered vehicle theft report saying his car was, you know, recovered by him. And uh, I didn't know it, but he committed insurance fraud. So he tells me, he goes, listen, I want to be honest with you. I was going to collect on the car. It was, I said, John, how much is the car worth? He says, 3000 I said, John, I would have gave you fucking three thousand dollars for this. You know, I mean, it's crazy. So he goes down and tells one of the big bosses because his partner's father was a big boss, and he tells him what he did. And I said, John, you're making a big mistake. So he went down there and told this guy, who was a deputy superintendent, what he did. And I told him, John, when you tell that man, he's going to have no alternative but to launch you. So he took him off the task force, sent him back to SOS, and then he was working for the state's attorney. And then how does that get? The state's attorneys. Yeah. So, so what is, he just goes like, hey, like, yeah, don't, don't he, take me. Like, let me tell you yes, this. Yes, exactly. Because they were going to charge him with, uh, with insurance fraud. Uh, so he gave up everybody. Uh, and of course I was the number one guy. So he gave me up because I was the most senior guy and, uh, you know, everything was to, you know, came to blame on me. Uh, and I'm not saying I didn't do a lot, you know, all of that stuff he said I did. Most of it was true. Um, but the thing is he didn't take his weight. He fucking snitched for, for $3,000 insurance fraud. So he started giving up everybody and then everybody started going to the grand jury or grand jury. And I was the last one that didn't cooperate. And that was 
kind of inevitable. It was either someone's going to get caught in the act or something like that, Correct. or someone was going to get jammed Correct. up doing something else, and then they're going to turn everyone over. Right. Okay, so then you get in that situation. Now, you, you're you kind of, I don't want to say vague in the moment, but like the number one guy. You said, mm-hmm. like, that's what people said. I don't really feel that way. Yeah. Were you the number one guy? I was the most senior and decorated guy. Mm-hmm. So maybe I was the number one guy. I mean, I I, def, I didn't take any orders from them, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Because these guys were simpletons, most of them. Uh, they did dumb stuff. Like Brzezinski had his fucking locker combination, st- the tag on it, still on his locker at the police station. He never took it off because he couldn't remember anything. You know, so, so shit, shit like that. Yeah, so I was yeah. it was just dumb shit. So I mean, these guys couldn't make decisions, and I would tell them, you know, that you take the back door, you do this, you do that. So I guess if they make me the leader, I guess I was the leader. Yeah, like if you're giving the orders to giving, yeah. getting everything. I mean, I, my contention is I was a fucking patrolman. We were all patrolmen. So I guess, you know, if they want to make me the leader, I guess I'm the leader. Yeah, so I get it. But in your mind, you're just like, hey, I'm the only one who knows I get shit done. So by default, you were the leader. Yeah, yeah, basically. In a sense. If, if that doesn't happen, how long do you think this goes? Well... I, you know, I won't mention names, but I know guys who fucking stole money up until the time they retired. Yeah. I don't know. I was dumb enough to get caught. How many, like, but don't they say like eventually everyone gets caught? I would think so. Yeah. Yeah. I would think so. I mean, I always thought, honestly, I, I always watched when I drove down the street to see if anybody was following me or watching, Mm -hmm. you know, get, get out of the car to go to the grocery store. You know, first of all, you're on, you're, you're. You're always going to watch because you're a policeman. So you want to see what's going on around you. Yeah. But sometimes something so obvious, like when those guys from the state's attorney office were following me, they were fucking bumbling idiots, man. These guys were so obvious. They had probably had never done this before, but you know, they were like state's attorney investigators and like, they were like fucking literally parked like a quarter of a block away sitting on my house. What, just in like trench coats and scooby no, no. or what? <laughs> yeah. Magic bus. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, uh, the magic mystery bus. But uh, no, I mean, they were just so fucking obvious, Eddie. I yeah. mean, it was crazy. Um, even the FBI guys, man, they parked they parked across the street from my house for a while. They had an IRS guy with them and he was driving, but literally parked across the street watching my house. I don't know. And then when... When I was working construction, when I got indicted, I'm digging in the street in Dalton. There's only four of us. They were all, we're all white guys. And, and I see white guys driving past back and forth and their heads are turning like, almost turning like, you know, the fucking exorcist to watch and, you know, see if they can see me. So I, I told the kid I was working with, Jay, I said, Jay, these, these fucking guys are coppers, man. They're probably following me. Was, it was kind of crazy. Mm-hmm. And at that time, had you uh, was that like a side job or you had resigned already? Or no, no, no. I was indicted. Okay. So, so you were. Yeah, I was indicted the first time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was indicted twice by the state. Uh, they gave me a $3 million bail and and then a $1 million or $2 million bail, which yeah. was, I didn't kill anybody. I thought it was kind of crazy. Did you did you raise it? Did you? I, I'm fortunate enough to have a family member who, who does well for himself. Right. And yeah, so they, they didn't, never thought I was going to get out of Cook County. And so, basically, to summarize the situation, like I said, I keep going back to it. Yeah, that's okay. You explained it so well yeah. in the long form one. Uh, everyone kind of flips on you, and you're mm-hmm. you're just a main point at this at this juncture. Yes. And are you you're like confident you're going to get off? You're no, no. <laughs> on the state, mm-hmm. I I felt we were going to get off because um, I'm not an attorney, but there's uh, a case law. It's uh, it's called Garrity. And um, they use the same attorneys to indict uh, all these policemen. They use the same attorney to go in front of the grand jury with the police officers. It, it, they, they, they're not supposed to do that. They're supposed to have separate attorneys. Uh, in addition to that, um, the state withheld evidence from us uh, on a case. And they knew they were withholding evidence. But my lawyer threatened them with the Garrity issues and, you know, uh, they went to the feds because I don't think they were actually going to be able to bring the state cases. And I think you said the only way you could have possibly gotten off is they really wanted someone higher than you, right? Yeah. Maybe a sergeant or something. And there yeah. was no, nobody was involved. No. From that standpoint. Legit, Eddie, no. And uh, when the U.S. attorney interviewed me, uh, the assistant U.S. attorney and the FBI agents, they were convinced I was lying. They said, you're covering up. You're covering up. And they named my lieutenant 
and they named some sergeants. They get these guys, you were fucking giving them money. And I go, listen, I, I'm not going to make something up to make you guys feel good. I, I'm just not going to do it. And I think you say in the podcast too, that the gifts that you were getting for those guys were pretty lavish too. Well, I, I, I mean, you know, Christmas gifts, taking them home for dinner. Yeah. Um. I, I don't really recall buying them anything like lavish, to be honest. Nothing with you. big? There wasn't like a Harley Davidson involved or nothing? There was a Harley. You, you've heard that rumor probably from someone else. A Harley Davidson um, was bought for a fundraiser, but had nothing to do with stolen money. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. It had nothing to do with stolen money. Because that was, that right? That was a big rumor. Oh, yeah. 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 That I bought uh, my lieutenant, uh, uh, Harley Davidson. Was that the craziest rumor you've been involved in with this whole? No, yes, no. Uh, they, they, I've been accused of murder, uh, a couple of murders. One was a kid who was missing from, uh, I locked up a guy in a cell side who a detective lived two doors down from him, worked in SOS, made detective. He asked me to go check this out because this kid was selling dope 24 mm seven. -hmm. The neighborhood we live in, that shit doesn't go on. Um, so we go over there. We didn't set up. We just watched. The girl came out of the house a couple times, the cars. Then he came out. So we just went and fucking booted the door and fucking went in the house. I found the kilo. And the best thing about it is he had all this Coca-Cola shit up on the wall. You know, like the uh, the tins and all Signs. that. Stuff. Yeah. And it was, it's garbage. So he, he's a criminal. He catches on. One of the guys I'm, I'm there with is infatuated with, oh, I, yeah, fuck, I collect this stuff, this and that. He goes, take it, man. Take it. And the kid's like, no, no. He says, no, no, take it. I want you to have it. I go, don't take that shit. So there's a kilo on the table. It's powder. And the one kid I'm working with, he takes all the Coca-Cola shit anyway. The kid says, take, he insists on taking it. So he takes it. So they, we walk out. I got the bad guy. We walk out. We get to the station. I said, bring the kilo so I can weigh it. So I go, where's the kilo? thought you had it i said no i had the fucking dude and they're like so we have to fly back there literally five fucking miles lights and siren and there's no kilo it's gone so we fuck i tell these two guys that i'm with salinas and villarreal i said i'm gonna tell you something one way or another a kilo better fucking show up here because we kick, fuck, kick the fucking door in this house and we're gonna have a problem they go out, they come back like 20 minutes later. They call me out of the interview room. I come out, they go, what? They go, come here. So they go in the bathroom and they open up a fucking plastic bag and in the bag is a clear plastic bag and it's got all this fucking brown powder in it. And I'm like, what the fuck is that? They go, it's a kilo. I go, of what? And they go, dude, it's a kilo. So I'm like, fuck it. I take it, weigh it. Take it up to the desk sergeant. He drops it. They put it in the safe back there. Log it in. Go to court. Before we go to court, no, this is like the next day. They're laughing. So I go, what's so fucking funny? They go, that was Aunt Jemima pancake mix. No shit. Yeah. So the Aunt Jemima case. Yeah. So the guy goes to Cook County Jail. He's sitting there for 30 fucking days on Aunt Jemima. Yeah. I mean, that's fucked up. That's super fucked up. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, I felt bad for the dude. Yeah. You know, so he beats the case and doesn't complain. How's that? He doesn't even complain about it. Damn. You know? So where, where, where's the kilo? The girlfriend probably beat us out of it because we had to fucking fly back there. Eddie, it was, these guys were morons, man. I'm telling you, they did some dumb shit. Dumb shit. Aunt your mama's pancake, pancake mix. Yeah. And yep. this guy did 30 days over it. Yeah. Well, could have been worse. Yeah, could have Could have had a kilo. Yeah, holy you know, shit. but still, yeah, he did thirty days for the Aunt Jemima case. And how often were you seeing shit like this? That was a one. That was an oddity, yeah, yeah, honestly, yeah. because we didn't have to fucking, you know, we didn't have to get Aunt Jemima pancake mix. We we always had the dope. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, these dudes, you know, and like weed, like fucking weed. I I didn't want to lock anybody up for weed, man. We came across. We we locked up some guys one time at Sixty uh, Fourth and Fairfield. They had three thousand pounds of weed, but it was that Mexican brick. You know, shit that's so hard. I mean, it's all probably stems and seeds. And it literally, it was like, took three guys to lift the fucking thing to put it in a, the back of the paddy wagon. So just Big old hunk of weed. Yeah, big shit. And yeah. they, I guess they just chip it off. I don't know if they, you know, uh, re, uh, you know, water or something. I, I don't know. But who the fuck can smoke that? Mm -hmm. It's like a brick. Do you, like, 
as far as like re- regret for you have that you obviously you went you gave away your freedom do you have regret for you know the portrayal of the badge because i know how much you pride you took in being a Chicago oh yeah cop. well here's the thing um they shut down special operations mm-hmm. uh my my case and a couple other things but mine was instrumental um there were a lot of good guys there and uh my allegiance honestly there was nothing in this world i wanted to do besides being a policeman and a chicago policeman so uh yeah i i you know i let them down you know the guys the women that work that job so uh i'm sure they were embarrassed by it because it's in the paper and uh you know it reflects on them because they're wearing that uniform yeah is that something like 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 how like nowadays now how you've been out for how many years uh, I've been out seven years. Seven years. So how much does this still like kind of take up your mind or is it kind of behind you at this point? Well, it was behind me. I did this podcast. Yeah, until you <laughs> so started fun. doing, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but um, there there isn't a day that doesn't go by. I mean, uh, honestly, Eddie, I loved I loved that job. There isn't a day that goes by. I'm 61 and mm-hmm. there's, a, there's not a day that goes by that I'd say, fuck, I'd like to be out there, you know, fucking chasing these bad dudes, mm-hmm. you know. Of course, that's, and even if I didn't go to prison at 61, I wouldn't be chasing bad dudes. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it was, uh, honestly, it was, uh, like I told, uh, some attorneys in a, um, deposition one time, I said, as far as I'm concerned, this is being a policeman in Chicago is better than being a fighter pilot. The, the fucking adrenaline was just incredible. Um, and I, you know, I used to say it was like, you would have ringside tickets to the greatest show on earth, literally, uh, people yeah. at their best people at their worst. Yeah. And you see, I lost, you know, I had a friend on this job, John John Knight. He was killed in 1999. Great guy, family man. He had uh, children. And, uh, you know, uh, I felt bad about that, too. Um, there was another guy from 21. I didn't know him well, but I saw him in passing, Jimmy Camp. But there were a lot of coppers that lost their lives. And, you know, but like I said, I was I was 100% uh, the police, man. I loved being the police, you know, living and breathing the police. And is that high something that you've never been able to... No, place. no. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm looking up at that uh, shelf with the Miller lights on it. I try on Saturday night sometime, you know, but mm-hmm. uh, it's not the same. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's nothing like chasing somebody 70 miles an hour uh, or chasing a guy with a gun, you know, or into a building. You know, I mean, it's uh, it's something that um, really it's something you have to experience. How many real police would you say still exist in the city? Yeah, there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of guys I don't even, I mean, there's probably nobody I know left on the job, Mm -hmm. but um, there are some coppers out here doing good work every day, men and women, but their hands are tied, Eddie, Uh, truly. Just a different time. Different time. Mm -hmm. Uh, The cameras killed everything. Um, You know, um, I don't condone it, but, you know, some guy gives you a fucking lip, you know, gangbanger, he's going to get fucking socked in the stomach. You're not going to let this is back in the day. Yeah. You're not going to let somebody just, you know, uh, you know, talk to you like that. And, and, uh, you know, in front of everybody else on the street, you, you got to make an example out of that guy because every copper that comes after you is going to get the same treatment from him, you know? And this is just kind of affecting the whole law and order process in your mind. Yeah. I'm not saying beating people down, but I'm just saying the cameras, the, the consent, the consent decree. Uh, I think policemen have pulled back, um, it's it's negative right now to uh people look at the police in a negative light uh you'll see a nice you know feel good story a copper saves some kid or you know shoots it out but i mean i i can't recall that many policemen getting killed in memory for a long time for those you know people who are against the police what would you say to them be like well you're the one you're saying i rationalize that i was taken away from criminals but you're the damn criminal look what you did and you know you go back to the nancho mima story like this is Mm-hmm. This is, there is no good versus evil here. There mm-hmm. is only, you know, this is only humans doing human mm-hmm. shit. How would you respond with that? Yeah, I mean, I understand people, like, most of the time when you uh, are, you encounter the police, um, it's not, hey, how are you, or, you know, you know, unless you live next door to somebody who's a policeman. Most of the time, they're pulling you over, or, you know, they're coming because you were a victim of a crime, uh, or they're stopping you to see what you're doing. They're not stopping uh, good people. I mean, for traffic, yeah, but there's a lot of people out here who are preying on other people, and policemen know that, and they see that. But there are cops uh, that, like myself, who 
before I was effective, but I crossed the line. And uh, I can see their, you know, their hatred for policemen like that. But not all policemen are like that. Mm -hmm. There's not a human's been. It's just people are. I can. The thing I could say, Eddie, and I, you know, I regret. Like I said, I I regret every day what I did. Um, but when I did do my job, um, I I went overboard, and it didn't make a difference if it was a black community or a Hispanic community or a white community, which I very seldom was in. Uh, I gave it everything every day. I gave it my all because those people deserve service too. Um, so like I said, I mean, I, I feel bad for what I did, uh, but I can, you know, I could say I did a lot of good work. I saved a lot of lives, little, mm -hmm. literally. Mm -hmm. And then in the, in the end, so you served 10 years mm -hmm. and is that just the most miserable 10 years? Yeah. You know, people, you know, you're not seeing people get stabbed to death in prison. I mean, you probably in the penitentiaries, I was in a medium high. Uh, there was some stuff in there. I saw one guy get stabbed, but he had it coming. He was beating up on an old guy all the time. Uh, and they warned him, um, you know, a lot of drugs in there, uh, a lot of homosexuality in there. So it's a crazy thing. I, I'll tell you some of the stories too. I was, you know, you, you, like in the chow hall, you have five tables. The whites are the smallest percentage in the, in the bureau of prisons. So you have five tables, literally in a, in a print, you know, it's got probably 150 tables. So you have to wait to sit down to eat your food. You have to stand there with your tray. Then when you go through the chow line, the white guys aren't working the chow hall. It's black guys or Hispanic guys. And you get a CP, which is called the Cauc uh, Caucasian portion. They're getting, the guys in front of you are getting fucking shitloads of food. You go through and they're giving you one little scoop, man. And you're like, what the fuck? You know, get back in line. You can't get back in line because they'll jam you up. And you this know? is a low, this was the low security one? No, this was at? the medium. The medium. Yeah, the medium. Uh, the, it's, it's very, it's a very segregated uh, atmosphere. Um, the blacks and the whites and the Hispanics, uh, they do business with each other, but they don't jive with each other. No one, no one hangs out with each other outside their race. It's, it's, it's kind of a crazy system, man. Were you ever challenged? I had one fight in there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, in 10 years, and the guy I was fighting with was uh, bipolar and did not know it. And he came in late from us. We played cards every day. And I go, where the fuck were you, man? And he, and he fucking threw his radio at me. You know, we had these clear radios. And he threw his radio at me, and I, I couldn't let that go because then I would have been a victim. So him and I went up to a cell and fought while somebody watched out. He probably hit me four or five to one. That's how fast he was. Damn. Yeah, yeah, and but I, I, he was a skinny dude, but I finally overpowered him and you know got some back on him. But this dude was fucking fast, dude. Yeah, big yeah. tall Hispanic kid. Were you like obviously you were, you were always sure of yourself being a policeman, but were you pretty nervous though? Going like, to prison? Yeah, you? initially like oh like, oh, oh fuck, fuck yeah. yeah. And and the thing is, the internet, anybody can find out what you were, so you you don't lie. Did you get more shit because of that? They either talk to you or they didn't talk to you. So a lot of guys like, you know, I don't give a fuck what you did in the world. That's what they would say. Yeah. You know, but there were some guys that they didn't talk to you. You know, there were some mob guys in there. Some talked to you, some didn't. It was funny. There was a guy who was an underboss for uh, one of the big crime families in New York. And I uh, was making pizzas, homemade pizzas out of tortillas and, you know, pepperoni. And then you get yeah. vegetables from the kitchen. So my vegetable guy would come. He'd come knock on the door. He'd pull his drawers down. He'd pull a plastic ball uh, bag out from underneath his balls. And my roommate would be like, you know, he'd walk out and he says, I'm not eating them fucking vegetables. They were under his balls. I go, they're in a double plastic bag, dude. Fucking don't eat them then. So, you know, I make a pizza for this guy. His roommate, he says it was for him. He tells me, get, he says, get away from me. I don't want to talk to you. So I make him another pizza, bring it over there. The next day I see him. He weighs me over in the yard. I walk over there. I go, what's up, Patty? And he goes, that was the best fucking pizza I ever had since I've been locked up. I'm like, what the fuck, dude? I would have been dead on the street for a fucking stinking tortilla pizza. You know what I mean? It's cra it's a crazy world in there, man. And you were in the, the subway guy was in there? Yeah, you? Jared Fogle. Yeah, he was in there. He got 15 years. And um, he kind of made uh, light, you know, like I said. I mean, you know, he, he said that he was just fucking underage uh, prostitutes. Jesus. And uh, and I told him you had a twelve year old daughter, Jared. I said, how would you like if someone fucked your twelve year old daughter? So were you guys like friendly or what was your? I mean, we weren't enemies, but I didn't hang out with him. I didn't yeah. hang out with him for the simple fact that he was a child molester. Did people fuck with him a lot? He got beat up one time, but a guy wanted to get out of that prison, 
So he beat them up because they would transfer him then. And that was it. He never had it. He's, I, from my understanding, he's doing bookie stuff there now. I talked to a couple guys that were guards there. Jared is? Yeah, he's like, he's like doing, uh, you know, they, they make a ticket up every week and people bet. And you can either put money on someone's books or stamps are the currency, U.S. Uh, postage stamps. So it's a strange fucking world, man. But honestly, Eddie, it is the worst, slowest time you can imagine. Whether you go out on the track, whether you go out and play bocce ball, which they had, uh, they had bags. You could play bags. Um, you know, uh, fucking tennis at the low. Um, volleyball. They had softball leagues, touch football league, the library. But there was no. Didn't make a difference, man. That fucking time dragged by. Yeah. Yeah. Ten years, long time. It was cool though. I got to watch the Cubs championship and the Blackhawks championship. The blacks that controlled the TV when I was there, the sports TVs. They were from Chicago. They were vice lords and GDs. So I got along with them, and they said, hey, man, go ahead and watch the series, both of them. But how do you get along with those guys? I would think that they yeah. were like. You know what? They didn't They didn't hold it against me. As a matter of fact, because, you know, like my personality, I joke about shit all the time. And, like, one guy told me, you know, he was, he was selling crack. He was from um, Denver, but he moved up to Casper, Wyoming, which is just above Denver. And Casper's got like a, not being racist, but Casper's got like a 0.5% black population. So I said, how fucking stupid can you be, dude? You're selling to all white people up there. Who do you think they're going to give up? You. So, you know, every time I told that story, I said, yeah, I'm going to go to Casper and I'm going to be rich. And they would laugh because this guy was a fucking idiot. But I, you know, I'd make fun of people like, you know, pers impersonations and stuff. And I pretty much didn't have any problems there, man. So it's being personable kind of. Yeah, yeah. And I told them, I said, listen, dude, I was the police. If you don't want to fucking be around me, I got gotcha. you. No now, big deal. Did the guards and everything uh, treat you a little better because of that or was it um, didn't they, matter? Pretty much 50-50. You know, I had some guys that were like, you know, hated the fact that I was the police and I was in there now. And uh, there were other guys that were real, real good with me. They didn't, they didn't fuck with me. I had other guys that would go in there, tear my shit up, my locker, fucking throw my stuff off the bed and yeah, whatever. And now what about now? When you see some of these old Chicago police that you used to be yeah, with. Yeah, I still, I still uh, probably have contact with uh, probably uh, close to a dozen guys still. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, they don't hold it against me and uh, uh, go out to, you know, we'll go to Bona or something, fucking have a pizza or something, you know, bullshit, laugh, tell stories. Have you seen anyone that did hold it against you? Maybe like didn't talk to no. you? No, like... no, because um, I mean, I work every day. Um, you know, I've been invited to parties. Uh, but didn't go because fuck, I went to prison. You know, I'm not the police anymore or I'm not a retired policeman anymore. So why would I go to the fucking parties? Yeah. Is it, is it because like, is that like a little bit of shame or what is it really? Well, initially when I came home, I, I used to like, I'd go out to a breakfast or something with my wife and I, and I'd be like, Oh fuck. You know, I'd be looking around like, do they recognize me? Does somebody yeah. recognize? Cause I was in a fucking newspaper for like three years straight. And, uh, you know, I used to pray Obama would speak because then he'd be on the front page. Uh, it was just yeah. crazy. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, so it was like, you know, I'd always look around like, you know, I think that guy's looking at us. And, and my wife would say, you're fucking crazy. He's not looking at us. Yeah. You know, but that, that went away too. So, I mean, I'd, I served my time and, uh, yeah. I don't, you know, fuck it. I did my time and I don't know anybody. I didn't put anybody away. So, fuck it. Yeah. So everything's kind of, life is quiet. It was quiet until you started doing this shit again. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, but I, I honestly, I do. I mean, you know, like I said, the podcast. Uh, I'll plug it. You know, that Finnegan's take. It's available mm -hmm. on Apple or Spotify, yep. and uh, or anywhere you get your podcasts. And uh, you know, I, I hope somebody you know would listen to it uh, and have an objective mind. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there. I told talked about two of my brothers who passed away. Yeah, and uh, you know, uh, it was kind of linked in with police officers, um, but. For the most part, uh, yeah, I wanted to tell a little bit about my story. Um, and if that's, I guess, the lasting piece we could kind of wrap up here, like what what is something you want, like really to stick with people? Well, I want them to, when, when they hear the story, I want them to hear uh, that I wasn't out there just stealing money every day. I was out there doing, you know, police work and I fucked up and, and uh, let greed uh, get the better of me. And I wish I hadn't. Uh, but, uh, there was nothing better than that job. And I did it. I, I, you know, did it to the best of my ability and I did a lot of good work. 
All right, Jerry. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me, Eddie. I appreciate it very much. And then sp spell your name too, because it's a yeah, different it's, Finnegan. So I want yeah, to make sure so people are able to yeah, find it. Yeah, it's Finnegan, F I N N I G A N, take. Finnegan, it's apostrophe S, take, T A K E. Mm -hmm. It's and a mini series, 15 episodes, like you said, Apple, Spotify. Yes. Uh, really interesting stuff. So obviously, like you said, not, not good, not good, but you, uh, you yep. paid your price. Yep. I appreciate it. Thank you, Eddie. Thanks, Jerry. All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks for watching. That's it for today. Uh, we'll see you guys next time.